Welcome back to Supreme Myths. I am so pleased today to have as my guest, uh, Professor Dr. Mary Ann Franks. Um, she is the Michael R. Klein Distinguished Scholar Chair at the University of Miami uh, Law School, a graduate of Loyola College, um, a master's and a PhD from Oxford, pretty impressive, a Harvard Law degree, author of the book, The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Devotion to Guns and Free Speech. Everybody watching this or listening to this knows how much I'm going to like that title. Um, she's also working on her second book called Fearless Speech, which I can't wait to read. She's also the um, director of something called the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, which we will get to. She is a national expert on numerous issues involving the Constitution, speech, technology. Welcome to Supreme Myths. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. So we are taping this uh, on Tuesday uh, in the middle of the afternoon. We won't, it won't come out for a few more days. So the confirmation hearings we are currently living through uh, will be over by then. Thank God this podcast took me away from Ted Cruz's testimony. Uh, questions? <laughs> well, testimony is more accurate, probably. Um, but let, we're going to talk about your book a lot. But let's start with current events and the confirmation hearing. What is your general sense? I think we both like Judge Jackson as my guest. But what is your general sense of things? Well, you're certainly right about that. I think um, Judge Jackson's extraordinary. This is, you know, for everything else that's going on in terms of the performativity of these hearings, I, I don't want it to get lost, and I hope it doesn't get lost, the truly historic nature of this moment. So it's been both um, immensely sort of gratifying to watch because, you know, seeing someone with her wonderful qualifications and her, her composure and her brilliance um, but also just just disappointment, um, although entirely predictable disappointment in the way that so many Republicans have decided to try to make this into um, a really shameful spectacle of partisanship. So it's been a it's been a real mixed bag. Like all confirmation hearings, I think, or or most at least in our in our respect, I'm much older than you, but in our respective lifetimes, uh, yeah. I, so kind of run idea one idea by you, and I'm very curious. Sure what your expert opinion is on this. I wrote a piece once after Justice Kagan's confirmation hearing where I argued that she was the perfect person to make the following point, which she didn't make, and I was really hoping she would make. Um, her, con her confirmation was not for a swing seat, so it wasn't going to be a big, that big a deal. Plus, she was dean of Harvard. So I wrote a piece saying what she should say is, when you ask me about abortion, affirmative action, and guns, and related issues, um, I'm not going to sit here and say I don't have opinions. Of course I have opinions. I've been a dean of Harvard Law School. I've been a lawyer. I've been all these things. Um, I've still served general of the United States. Of course I have opinions. And I'm going to share those opinions with you today. I will not make any promises, no commitments. Don't ask me. I won't do it. But I'm also not going to sit here and pretend I don't have opinions. As a judge on the Supreme Court, I may change my mind on any of these issues without the actual facts. I can't decide the case. But I will, I will truthfully give you my opinions today. My colleague, Neil Kinkoff, said she would never have been confirmed if she had done that. I don't agree. I think she would have been. I think CNN would have played that clip, um, and I think the American people would have loved it. Do you have a thought on this? I think my, my thought is that I want so much for you to be right, because I would have <laughs> loved a moment like that. And yeah. it would have been it would have been so important. Um, I, I guess I'm assuming a lot about why, why you would have wanted her to say yeah. this, but I guess for my own purposes... I, yes, I would so much want to see a Supreme Court nominee admit that, of course, all judges have opinions, of course, all judges have views on these issues, and that this entire pretense that we all go through of saying, well, the, the court is neutral, law is neutral, judges are neutral, listening to people have to talk about balls and strikes, I just wish someone would tear the mask off and say, you've got to be kidding, we all know that this isn't true, and make that larger point about how of course, we want neutrality as an aspiration. That is supposed to be what we, we are striving for. But if we ignore the fact that we are all beginning from a position that is not neutral, we can never aspire to that. We are, we are foreclosing that possibility. So I would, have, I would have thought that would be a tremendous moment. I, I think I do fear that it might have meant that she wouldn't have been confirmed or that she would have been, if she had been confirmed, there would have always been this dark cloud because you, you, the the problem with being honest and confrontational and and correct about so many things <laughs> in the current environment is that you get vilified for that because no one else is going to admit to it. It's it's going to be seen as ah she has confessed to her bias and it would have never um, been more of a sophisticated read than that is is what I fear. Yeah, my colleague said that um, we fought about it a little bit in the law review. Um, 
I don't know the answer. Um, I, I did think part of my argument was because she was dean of Harvard, because her seat wasn't that important, she had a little more credibility than maybe some of the other. Um, but anyway, um, well, I'll be relieved when this um, hearing is over and Judge Jackson is confirmed. I fully expect her to be confirmed, right, unless some bizarre thing happens the next couple Right, days. right. Yeah. Okay. By the time this airs, she'll be confirmed, I think, I hope. Or at least, yeah, I think the vote will be before then. All right, let's talk about your book, this wonderful book called The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Devotion to Guns and what a Free Speech. I'm so jealous of that title. It's such a great <laughs> title. Um, why do we have a – let's do it in order. Let's start. Um, why do we have a deadly devotion to guns, which I think is going to be an easier conversation than a deadly devotion to free speech. Um, and I think you include the internet in here too, but let's talk about guns first. Yeah, and, and part of the answer to that is, you know, why do some people have a deadly devotion <laughs> to guns and how are all of us trapped in the world that they have built for us? And I think a big part of this is because there's the general attachment to the Constitution, which um, as you have written about extensively as well, is not a rational attachment. It is in many ways first and foremost, a very um, ignorant attachment. And when I say ignorant, I mean in a very specific sense that most Americans haven't read the Constitution, much right. less understood it or followed important Supreme Court cases. And that's not a, and I'm not laying the, the blame of that on the average American. I think there's something fundamentally wrong with civic education in the United States. But we're talking about an attachment to a text that has all kinds of problems, but even beyond that is a text that most people don't read and don't understand. And what happens is when we have these educational early forces encouraging us to think of our Constitution as this quasi divine document, you get people who really take that seriously and and all the way from people who genuinely think that there's some sort of divine hand at work in the Constitution to people who come pretty close in a secular sense to saying these men were so great and so ahead of their time and they saw so many things and and so you have all of that, and then you add on to this the the idea that there, the Constitution affords a kind of liberty or a kind of um, blesses a certain type of activity that is deeply meaningful for someone's identity, something like guns. And then you have just the convergence of those two things, passionate, um, emotional, non-rational attachment to the document, <laughs> a very selective reading of that document to pick out this part of the Constitution, Second Amendment, pretty short. Um, yep and say that's the most important part, take an interpretation of those um, few words that is really unusual and ahistorical and, and have it match up with the way that people want to, to, to use as a kind of cover for their own self-interest. So instead of just walking around saying, I love guns, I'm scared of everything, I need four weapons to walk into the grocery store, you can say, I respect the constitution, I am a true American, that's why I have to have four guns and walk into a grocery store. And that's what's so tempting about it. That's what's so tempting about all texts that we apply these fundamentalist attitudes to is that it allows us to be just sort of shamelessly self-interested because we can wrap it in this, um, this mantle of saying, I'm actually just defending the Constitution and defending all of our rights. Right. Um, you know, and during the confirmation hearing today, um, I believe it was, I forget which Republicans, uh, what, uh, which Republican senator it was, was, uh, was Mike Lee of Utah trying to um, impugn unenumerated rights, and uh, as conservatives tend to do, yet the right to own a gun in self-defense in the home, regardless of how important it is, regardless of whether it's something, is in fact an unenumerated right. Because all the Constitution talks about is guns and a militia. It doesn't talk about guns in the home. Why is that? That's a very simple idea. I put on Twitter, a lot of people responded. Why is that so hard for Americans to understand? That in, you, can, you can be in favor of gun rights, and some liberals are, Keel Lamar, Sandy Levinson, but not under the Second Amendment. They're in favor of them under substantive due process, then we're back to row. It's such a simple idea. Why can't people get it? Well, I think it is because of that that passionate attachment that underlies these arguments, because it's that constitutional register that gives so much legitimacy to these these debates. Um, exactly as you say, there's there's no reference. Not only is there no reference to self defense in the Second Amendment, there's right. also no reference to guns as such. It says arms, and right. that 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 by itself is a right. is an interesting choice of phrase, especially if we're going to be textualist or originalist about what that right. means. And yet people are absolutely convinced that it means my guns wherever I want. And that doesn't make sense as a matter of interpretation. It doesn't make sense as 
under any sort of theory of, of reading that's intelligible, it doesn't make sense. So why do people insist on it? It's precisely because it doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> it's because if you have this, this background in our culture, which we do, which is the strongest way to shut down an argument and to lay claim to superiority without having to make a real argument is by invoking the constitution. That's what people are going to do. Right. And I, and I mean it when I say that, that the, the comparison between religious fundamentalists and constitutional fundamentalists is real in the sense that the kind of violent reactions that you will get to, to being presented with that cognitive dissonance, this idea that it doesn't say what you think it says. Right. Um, it, it is really this, it goes way beyond any kind of cognitive response. It is intuitive for people. It strikes at their identity and they refuse to believe, you know, because there's this kind of, for lack of a better term, a universalization process that whatever I believe must be protected by the constitution has to be in the constitution. And if you attack my reading, you are attacking me, which is attacking the constitution, which is attacking all of America. And it's all tied together in this really unhealthy way. You're making, that's a great answer. You're making me sad for a very personal reason. Um, so my, my second book was called Originalism is Faith for yes. all of the reasons that you just said so beautifully. I actually wish I had called it Constitutionalism is Faith. Hmm. And I think, I, I thought about it. Sandy Levinson, of course, wrote a famous book about a similar, not the same title, but a similar one. That's the main reason I didn't do it. I could have written pretty much the same book and called it Constitutionalism as Faith. Um, and I think what you're describing is exactly right because I'm not a person of faith. I respect people of faith. I'm not a person of faith. Um, to me, faith and reason are kind of opposites. I understand other people don't think that. I once had a, a priest on here. We had a big debate about that. It was very fun. Um, but I, I don't, whatever he says, I still don't think. I think faith is here and reason is here. Um, do, you, do you think there is among law professors uh, a kind of, I don't want to use the word irrational, but religious-based faith? in the Constitution? Forget, I'm not talking now about the, the American people, just law, con law professors, because I think there is, and I'm curious what you think. Yeah, so I, I, in my book, I mention how a lot of excuses and explanations can be offered for your average person not knowing history, not knowing the doctrine, and having this kind of attachment, right. and then responding to myself by saying, well, so far as that goes, it's not ideal, but it's okay because the learned class, right? <laughs> Um, knows that, that that these things are not true. And and then I go on to say, yeah, it turns out that, that <laughs> class is, is just as susceptible as yeah. everyone else. We may have more um, facts at our disposal. We may be able to point to more cases, but that underlying irrational attachment, I, I, I do call it irrational attachment. None of us escape it. We, we either, it's back to that bias question, right? Which is you either talk about your, the fact that you have opinions and biases and attachments and work hard to test them or you deny that you have them at all. And a lot of academics are are like a lot of politicians and a lot of uh, like a lot of advocates who just simply refuse to acknowledge that there's um, an issue here that that for many people, law professors included, invoking the constitution stands in for neutrality. It's a, if I invoke the constitution, I'm clearly being neutral when that's an absurd position to begin <laughs> with. And I know every time someone tries to do that, I think you just as you've just told me that that you you have no idea about how to test your own intuitions about this if you think that invoking the Constitution is a neutral exercise as opposed to a very particular directed exercise and a very selective exercise. What, what, what is fascinating about that answer to me, um, and I haven't thought through this, so this is a little bit improvisation here. Um, my one of my mentors is Mark Tushnet, um, famous critical legal theorist. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Mark would have agreed with every syllable you just uttered, um, a as would some other people associated with the critical legal studies movement of the 1960s and, and, and 70s. Um, but what's interesting is I read the early Bork to say exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, that where the Constitution is clear, we follow it, and presidents have to be 35 and senators. But for the imprecise clauses of the Constitution, um, they're mostly like ink plots. And when judge gets in, when judges get an ink blot, they should defer. Now Bork did not hold true to that throughout right. his career, but it was his early work, and I think it's right. So I think it's interesting. The far left and the far right at one point agreed on what you just said, and what I believe. Do you agree? Is that a fair summary? 
I think that's right. And, and that something has happened to discourse in the last, let's say, decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure where to pin it, where things have gotten much more divergent in more subtle ways, even than the obvious ways that we have. But yes, that there used to be just more. There are some things that just were so obvious to people right. at one right. point that we now can't even say that there, there's a you know, what opens my book is 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 my in my preface. I'm concerned about how so much of my book feels like I'm stating incredibly obvious things. And then I, I in my research for the book, I was I came across a quote by Orwell where he talks about how, you know, in in times of real danger, you know, saying the obvious thing is actually going to be the hardest thing because yeah. those yeah. moments are when obvious truths and things that were in fact um, logically apparent to people have gone out the window. And now we're in a we're in a you know, uh, sort of society of the absurd where you can't even can't even talk about things that have to be true. So, yes, I think there was at one time more more recognition of this very obvious fact about yeah. the Constitution. You know, boy, that just triggered something else in me, literally triggered. Um, there's I, I'm pretty open <laughs> about my what I want to say. I'm not one to pull punches. There is something about Justice Thomas I've never said that I really want to say. Um, and I'm not going to say it now, and I'm, I'm probably never going to say it. Um, I think he presents a crisis for the American people, like you were just saying. Um, I think he's, I do think he's awful. I've said that many times. Um, yet there are things I won't say about him that I think are true that I won't say. Um, and Orwell's Aure right. <laughs> Those things need to be said. And even someone who is willing to go out on a lot of limbs, the court's not a court, like me, I'm not willing to say what I really want to say about Justice Thomas. And I, that... I know that's reflection on me or the culture or both. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a coward. I don't know. But um, I do think it's really hard in, the, in this moment of time with the Internet being 20 years old, and you write a lot about the Internet, to say courageous things. I think saying courageous things is getting harder and harder and harder. I have been attacked viciously from my left, from my left, and I'm very left, several times over the last few years. Because I said true things. Um, I said the Obamacare case was not going to strike down Obamacare, and I'm sure of it. And you don't have to believe me. You can believe all these conservatives who said it. Blah, blah. They killed me for that as being insensitive to the disabled community. I'm not insensitive to the disabled community. I wanted to say to them, you have so much to worry about, and you have so many legal impediments to equality in this country. This is one thing to take off your list because you're not going to lose this case. And I got killed for saying that. Um, but going back to the other, do you think it's harder to say courageous things these days and 20 years ago? Well, in some ways, I think it's harder for us to even decide what a courageous thing is yeah. to say. That, you know, one of the the sort of platitudes now in, in our public discourse is to talk about cancellations and to talk about self-censorship. And the New York Times has jumped into this yes. phrase several, yes. several times recently. And so much of that discussion, I think, is really... Um, regrettable because what it, what you know you scratch the surface of those and it tends to be this just terrible equation between things like not feeling that you are welcome in a community or that people don't love you in the classroom all the way to um, you know actual state censorship of what yeah. teachers can say in schools and anyone who's conflating those things I think is doing something fundamentally very dishonest but what that what it's also doing is it's it's making it harder for us to have a conversation about things that are genuinely still considered um, off the table for, for discussion, some difficult truths, or may not even be correct ones, but part of the spirit of debate is that they don't have to be correct. That, that's part of how we discover the truth is that we, we talk about ideas and see how far they can take us and they might evolve. But I do really, I am quite upset that, that, that there's been such an ideological hijacking of the conversation about what's difficult to say because it's so occupied by politicians who didn't get the first book deal, but got the third. <laughs> and, you know, people who get, and even students who get to write in the New York Times about, you know, their uncomfortable experiences, right. that they're taking over the conversation that if anyone had really cared about, certainly doesn't start now. It starts so much earlier about what people are not able to say and what people genuinely get um, attacked for. And when I say attacked, I think we need to be very um, we need to be demanding a lot of evidence for what we mean by attacks. The, the, the subjective part of this cannot rule the day. You know, what I call in my book victim claiming is pernicious right now among powerful individuals. Um, you know, Donald Trump complained that he's the most attacked president in all of history, right? You, you can't let people just, just diagnose for themselves whether or not they're being censored or silenced. Right. There has to be an objective assessment and we have to insist on it. And if we insist on that and we say, well, who is it? 
who's being targeted with physical abuse and threats and harassment and exploitation and firings, it's not politicians and it's not conservative students on, on college campuses. And I really wish we'd have a moment to talk about the things that seem to be truly uh, too controversial to discuss because we, we're not having that conversation now. Well, that's a great answer. Um, so I take it that if you were on the Supreme Court, by the way, I would vote for you, um, <laughs> you'd overturn Heller? I think, I think... Leaving aside issues, uh, no, well, leaving aside issues of how that will affect the world politically. As a matter of constitutional law, would you overturn Heller? Yeah, I guess I'm hesitating a bit because I'm trying to imagine the, the case that presents the opportunity yeah. um, in, in a way that would make sense. And I, I think I'm thinking very pragmatically about your question. You know, on a certain level of generality, if given the chance to to reorient um, what I think makes, you know, and I think this is actually a very, in some ways, complicated philosophical question about what do you do once the court has made a mistake, right? right. How, do you, how do you undo that damage right. when you have precedent that says this is what this amendment means? You know, taking into account that I want to be principled about this because I'm thinking about, of course, the attacks on um, reproductive right. rights and, and, you know, the whole, it's not, it won't surprise you, of course. I mean, that, that it's Scalia on all sides of that, right? So yes. on the one hand, <laughs> you know, we, we have to obey precedent and, you know, you have to, and then when it comes to Roe, every chance he gets saying, well, we need to overturn that because, yes. you know, so trying to be careful about that and be principled about the way that one would overturn mm -hmm. a decision, especially the longer it sits there and the longer it generates more and more reliant case law. Um, I enough. think, yes, yeah. but what I, what I, I guess I'm, I feel more comfortable saying I wish that had, I wish it had not been possible under our system for a decision like Heller to have been to have been handed down. And and were Scalia really an originalist or a textualist or just a principled <laughs> justice, it never would have been. We agree on that 100 percent, of course. Um, so one more question about guns. Um, and it's a hard one, I think. And, and um, I've given a lot of thought to this in my life because um, I met my wife giving a talk to Planned Parenthood. Um, that was 15 years ago, but I worked for Planned Parenthood before that. I volunteered for Planned Parenthood. I am pro-choice all the way down, and I think Roe and Casey were wrongly decided. Um, so for me, I'm with Judge Wilkinson of the Fourth Circuit, who wrote a law review article like two months after Heller came out, saying Heller is just Roe. And uh, people like guns, people don't, no one likes, no one likes abortions, but people know abortions are necessary. And, and as necessary or more so than guns, in my opinion, but leaving that aside. Um, so is Roe, are Roe and Casey, leaving aside stare decisis? Because I, I think I read you as, as Heller was wrongly decided in the first instance. Now we have to decide what to do next. And that's a hard question. I agree. Were Roe and Casey wrongly decided? Well, that is a good question. And when I read Wilkinson's opinion, you know, yeah. there's a part of it's it's a cheap and easy thing as a, as a liberal right to say, ha, huh, you see, you hypocrites, <laughs> you know, the conservatives are doing. Right. But of course, if we take him seriously, what yeah. he is saying is that Roe's wrongly decided. So yeah. if you do celebrate his criticism of Scalia at Heller, then you have to yes. have to take the take it seriously on the other side. And it and it really did give me pause. Right. Do I think if I think Heller's wrongly decided is is Roe wrongly decided? So I'm going to give kind of an evasive answer first, which is that I wish it had not been brought on the grounds that it was. I think the right to abortion is founded in the 13th Amendment. So <laughs> I wish I wish that had been how this had come up. I don't I am a little nervous about the idea of using I mean, I think you can make an equal protection argument for for reproductive rights in the sense of treating women differently from men. Me That's too. a much stronger argument. Me too. The, the the questions about fundamental liberty and I I'm more nervous about those because I do think they can be used to justify any number of, of yeah. um, actions or beliefs that or that that I, I am more uncomfortable with so I I am I am one of those who believes that women have the right to control their reproductive destiny but I wish that Roe and Casey had not had not come up on the ways I, I wish we were not on this path um, when it right. comes to reproductive rights. I mean, and that really writ large, right? The idea that we'd single out abortion as an issue distinct from anything else, as opposed to talking about bodily integrity, as opposed to talking about a person's right to be able to make choices about what affects them, um, as opposed to uh, as opposed to this this narrowing of it and making it seem like abortion is different from any of those things. Right. Right. 
Do right. I think there? I, I don't know that I'd be willing to go as far as to say Roe and Casey are wrongly decided, because I think as long as we're living in a world where we can interpret the 14th Amendment to mean the right for your kids to learn German before the eighth grade, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, in a world like that, does do reproductive rights make more sense? Yes, I think they make more sense than that does. Right. But um, but I do wish that there had been a stronger, more robust basis on which to make that decision. I agree with that 100 hundred percent. I don't know if I would favor an equal protection decision for the right for to give women the right to an abortion, but I think I might. I think I probably would. What I don't favor is is the making up of rights out of whole cloth that you know that you're referring to. Um, I just think equality is where what I what I try to tell my teenage daughters um, and my 31 year old daughter still um, is you you can't be equal in a world where you can't control your body. You just can't be. And the for me, the most painful thing of all is the same conservative justices who want to overturn Roe, or wanted to, some are dead now, overturn Roe, believe strongly in this bodily integrity idea. They said it in um, right. the, the, right, the Cruzan case, other cases, you know, where there's an right. assumption that we have the right to control penetrations, literally, of our body. Right. Yet, yet, yet the government can tell women what to do with theirs. That doesn't make any sense to me as a matter of consistency. I do well, wish I, it had been decided on equality grounds because I think that's what it really is. Right. And, and, and I, I think that part of what troubles me so much about the whole line of cases is the fact that it could even become a case for the Supreme Court to decide. That is, that we wouldn't have even come up with a way necessarily to um, to try to invade men's rights in the right. same way. That, that the whole idea that it's put up for debate, that, it, that it's literally a question of just the arbitrariness of whether or not you can find it in the, the penumbras or not <laughs> is, is something that just seems so... I know that that is the, the pragmatically speaking, this is the world we live in, but that's what strikes me as so awful about this is that it's not even phrasing it as no right to abortion. No, it's it, there's an unlawful interference with a woman's liberty when she's denied the right to an abortion. That That right. is how it should have always been presented. But instead, it becomes this question of, oh, women want special treatment of some right. kind. Right. And then you have all the other moralistic attachments to that. But that's the wrong. All of that is the wrong framing. And it already stacks the deck against women's full equality because it treats women as if they are asking for something additional as opposed to fighting against the idea that they are being um, unequally interfered with in a way that men never would be. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been trying to think of a way to articulate this because you write so beautifully about white male supremacy and that, that, a lot of that is, is underlying a lot of your work, and I agree with it completely. It is amazing to me that in 2022, we're living in a world where the right to own a gun is going to get much stronger and the right of women to have autonomous lives is going to get much weaker. And yes. I just, I, it, it shows us that we haven't come nearly as far. We've, we've, come some, we've come some distance, but we haven't come nearly as far as I think people think we've come. Is that a fair assessment of your position as well? I, I think we have... Well, on the one hand, we've come very far because we started so very low. So right. That, <laughs> right. But also, right. we should right. never take for granted the idea that we're always going to keep going further, that we can't right. get rolled back. And that we're, we're in the midst of this now. Every time I teach family law, which I am at the moment, yeah. going back to these 1960s and 70s cases about contraception, giving them quotes about the, the necessary equality of women and the right for them to control their bodies and to control the number, uh, uh, the timing and, and um, you know, when they should, when and if they should have children and asking them to guess who came up with these quotes and revealing it to them that it's Richard Nixon and right. it's, it's George H.W. Bush because people agreed on this at one point. Um, this is devastating to know that we're back to litigating yeah. not just abortion, but contraception, right? That's clearly what's on the yeah. on the chopping block as well. Yeah. And that we've gone completely in this other direction where at a certain time, you know, NRA officials were saying nobody should promiscuously be toting guns in, in public to a position now that says you can't keep me from having my gun at the, you know, at, at the the daycare center, right? This is, this is, these are, these are bad steps that we have taken backwards. Nixon's views, I think, on abortion and affirmative action, which by, which he basically started, yeah. would be, yeah. would be somewhere around the moderate Democrat today, or maybe even the liberal yeah. Democrat today. And there's no Republican today that I know of who holds those kinds of kinds, no right. Republican in office, I mean, who holds those. It's right. really sad. So far, everything you and I have discussed, other than maybe my disagreement with Rowan Casey, uh, is a pretty standard progressive critique of what's going on in the world. <laughs> the second big topic of your book, though, is a place where you and I, and, and I'm so happy I found you, uh, where, where, where you and I um, disagree probably with 
of, of con law professors in this country, um, which is the okay. issue of, of free speech. So again, your book, The Cult of the Constitution, our deadly devotion to guns and free speech. Talk to me about why we have a deadly devotion to free speech. One of the reasons why I brought, you know, in my book, I actually go Second Amendment and then first, which yes. is a little confusing, I guess, on some levels. But it's partly because of what you just mentioned, which is that the the kind of conservative viewpoint on the Constitution, that religiously infused idea is one that I think progressives kind of comfortably say, yeah, I'm with you on this. Like, <laughs> right. It was those crazy, right. you know, you know, gun nuts over on the one side. Right. right. And it's really important for me to set up that as a framework than to say, you need to understand or, or please observe <laughs> just how similar um, the, the, the rhetoric and the practices around the First Amendment question as it is to the Second Amendment question, that the parallels are so deep, right? That when there are people who know better, right? Law professors, the heads of civil liberties organizations saying things like, well, that's obviously unconstitutional. The First Amendment wouldn't allow that. These are things that even just a couple of questions in it, which First Amendment, the one, I don't know, in 1890s versus the one in 1915 versus four years ago, right. the idea that something is static and obvious about what the First Amendment does and doesn't allow, you hear people on the left doing it all the time, and now increasingly also on the right, because I do think that's where they found their convergence. And that should make, I think, you know, people on the left a bit nervous if, if you're converging with far right groups on the First Amendment question. So I think it's it's the same sort of set of values, which is people have attachments. So most progressives don't have deep attachments to guns. That's not part of their identity, but they have deep attachments to themselves as being enlightened um, sort of culture um, warriors in the sense of like, all ideas must be protected and we certainly can't eliminate any kind of, there can't be any kind of prohibitions or punishments for speech. And it's a it's a way that a lot of people get sort of infatuated with that, to think that it shows that they are principled and neutral if they say I'm a First Amendment absolutist. When saying you're a Second Amendment absolutist would, would I think, not garner the same. Yeah, you're disinvited kind of from the club, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so I think it's that, that people, that, you know, people, you know, non-conservatives certainly for, for a long period of time. Uh, would not have wanted to be affiliated that way with gun rights, but certainly have used free speech rights in that way. And that I do in the book make a pretty um, close analogy or, or draw a close analogy between the ACLU and the NRA because their rhetoric is so similar. Every time there is a, rest a potential restriction imposed or suggested on speech, the ACLU's response is the only, you know, the best response to bad speech is, is more speech. And right. any possible restriction is going to lead to a slippery slope where, for, you know, everybody's going to get censured. You're going to go to jail. And it looks so much like what the NRA does when they say the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. You're going to need to counter whatever the bad thing is with more of the same thing. That's the same logic you see in the NRA. And the NRA's entire base is activated on the premise that the very next thing is they're coming for your guns. Every possible, reasonable, sensible regulation gets met with this. That means they're going to break into your house, strip you of your pistols, and like you know, send you out into the street. The ACLU says, "Yeah, you let them do this. You you keep one Nazi from speaking, and the next thing you know." Um, I think slippery slope comes from free speech thing. cases, right? I think the idea of the slippery slope comes from free speech cases. You know, it, I, I think we've got we've certainly gotten to a point where people think that that is a good argument, yeah. and. You know, as a former philosophy professor, I, I have to remind my students that slippery slope arguments are bad arguments. They're <laughs> logical fallacies, right? right. You do, they, that's your strongest argument. You have a problem, right? Yes. And if, if we're going to say in the law that, oh, this particular decision would mean it makes it harder to draw lines down the road, well, that's all of law. Law is nothing but drawing hard lines around things. And it's a difficult right. process. And to pretend like there's clarity here in a way that there is for no other area of law, that's, it's, it's just, it, it is ridiculous, I think. In fact, I think there's a stronger, or as strong, originalist case against First Amendment doctrine today as there is against Second Amendment doctrine. Professor Judd Campbell wrote an amazing article in Yale saying that everything you think you know about the First Amendment, which you might agree with 100%, and which might be great stuff, yeah. has nothing to do with the original meaning of the First Amendment. And yes. he's 100% right about that. And when I say that to other liberal law professors, they scream at me and yell at me. And, I, and you know, even my close friends like Erwin Chemerinsky and Je Jeff Stone, people I really respect. I love, I, love, I love both of them. I mean, they both blur my books. I mean, uh, but, 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 but I think they really have a little bit of a, I think, I don't know if blind spot is a politically correct word anymore, but they, they have a little bit of a, I'm going to use it, blind spot on this question. 
because, like you say, David Cole of the ACLU, you get him in a room, and it's like, it's always a slippery slope. It's always, if this happens, everything. But there are values in life other than speech, like equality, like dignity. And this country doesn't seem to get that, but you do, I think, right? Well, I think that's one part of one yeah. absolutely essential part of the response is speech is not the only value. Right. The First Amendment isn't actually first in any kind of right. you know right. meaningful sense. It's it's a right. pure accent of history that it's first. It was supposed to be like eighth uh, or ninth or tenth or something. I, I mean, think it would have been third, third, but but in but yeah. in any event, it's not first. Yeah. And and yeah. the idea that that speech can be isolated sort of by itself and that we can protect it without running into problems. You know, what about the conflict between First Amendment rights and, say, you know, Fourth Amendment rights or right. Second Amendment rights? We, they, it has impacts on all of those those rights. So that's a big part of it. But the other part of it for me is even if you're just going to stay on the realm of speech, if you care about speech, you still don't get the answers that your average civil libertarian wants to give you because it's always a question of who gets to speak. If, as the ACLU has done, you were going to try to strike down every single law that would attempt to genuinely punish stalking or harassment or non-consensual pornography, you are making a commitment to the speech of abusers above the speech of the people they abuse. You absolutely are making that. So yeah. even before you get to equality in any kind of non-speech sense, we're talking about making a decision to whose speech to privilege over others. You know. Civil libertarians and First Amendment professors like to talk about the chilling effect a lot. And I, I'm always grateful to Professor Leslie Kendrick for, for writing a whole piece where she says, based on what empirical evidence do we have, really, that every time you, you, you have a speech restriction, people are going to freak out about even the, the things that don't come up to that line. So, so questioning that. While at the same time, we have so much empirical evidence to show that the lack of any protections for stalking or harassment or abuse mean that women in particular and people of color in particular will not speak because if they do, they have to worry that they are going to get um, deluged by death threats and rape threats and have their most intimate moments of their lives published to websites. And to say that that's a free speech protected position is just another way of saying you want free speech for men and not, don't care so much about it for women. And I wish people would just admit that if that's the kind of call they want to make, then just admit that that's what you're making. That's 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 fascinating. Um... I think I think what you just said can be boiled down a little bit to we live in a white male world and and they don't they like pornography. <laughs> uh, oh, know. absolutely, and yeah. that, that that is not it's not an accident, right? That that so much of the ACLU's own history is bound up with the porn industry, right? right. That the the money for the women's rights project that the ACLU started, which does tremendous work, was begun yeah. with money um, that was that was um, given by Hugh Hefner, right? That's something we need to talk about a little bit because it's complicated. And this idea that speech means being able to exploit anyone around you without any kind of response, that's a very strange, I would hope, it would be a genuinely strange version of speech to simply insist on over and against all the actual harm you see from that speech. And not just in terms of the fact that these women can never have a day's uh, tranquility in their lives and that they have health effects and psychological effects and lose their jobs and have to move from their homes, but also that they don't speak anymore, that they quit their jobs, they don't speak up in classrooms, right. they won't become you know, high profile on, online because, because of this kind of expression that, that is allowed, that is essentially um, this kind of silencing effect that that allowing that kind of abuse to to um, to exist with impunity will do to them. It will silence their speech. I, w I think I would add maybe to that that free speech doesn't help you much if you're starving and hopeless, homeless. Excuse also me. this, that the presumption that speech is the most important thing, you know, we, we talk sometimes, it's amazing how close some of the kind of the cancel culture warriors get to the right issue here, which is saying, can you believe this person got fired for something they said? You're so close to figuring out that maybe what's more important in some cases is whether or not people have reliable employment chances and whether at will employment is a really barbaric way to do things. Right. right. There are so many other conditions that go into making it possible for a person to speak. If you are struggling to get a job and you finally get that job, the idea that that you have freedom of speech in some ways, technically, um, and you can say whatever you want, that's not going to be true. And the idea that if you are a domestic violence victim, you have freedom of speech because the government won't put you in jail for something. You say, well, great, you know, but it doesn't <laughs> actually contribute right. to the conditions that would make it possible for, for the majority of people to speak. And if we cared about that, we care a lot more than about formalistic invocations of the First Amendment. And we'd actually ask those questions. What would it take for vulnerable communities to feel free to speak? 
I think I think, and I, I have not written like you have on 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 the the kind of theory of free speech and all that, but I think I think that free speech is not an end in and of itself. It is a tool to a more just, a better governed society. And if um, if a law that infringes some speech gets us closer to a more egalitarian, free, less impoverished society, then I think, I think in the balancing of values, starvation is worse than not being able to speak. Being mm-hmm. unemployed sucks. And, and I'm not even going to get to revenge porn. I'm going to get to the harassment part in a minute. But um, Europe understands this, you know. I mean, England and France and Spain and Germany, in my opinion, they have freedom of speech. But it's not like our freedom of speech. And I think they actually – doesn't mean they don't make some mistakes. and doesn't mean I don't agree. I don't agree with all of what they do. I have no problem with swastikers being illegal in Germany. I have zero problem with that. I, I'd have zero problem with Confederate flags being illegal here other than in museums maybe. Um, am I crazy to think that? I don't think at all. And I, I think that's one of those moments where you would expect liberals especially to be more conscious of – the kind of arrogant Americanism, right, that pervades yes. so much of these free speech arguments, yes. the idea that we uniquely have figured this out, right? Um, that France doesn't have free speech, that people in Germany don't speak freely, that right. that France's elections aren't better run than ours are. Right. Um, right. It's, it's amazing, especially even if you're even if we're just speaking culturally about, you know, ask those people in the whole rest of the world, do we think only in America can people truly speak their minds? But also asking, what about the actual markers of freedom of expression, like the the reporters index, right? The the democracy indexes. The United States is not at the top, right? right. So if we think that by having this very selectively absolutist view of free speech, we're getting better at protecting freedom of speech, there's no reason to think that that's true. Actually, I mean, right. Scandinavian countries are always at the top of those metrics, and they have, you know, when it comes to journalistic freedom, et cetera. And they have pretty stringent views on things that they classify as hate speech. And it's considered to be obvious that protecting free speech means nothing on its own. It's a, it's a little bit like, I think, how, how you described originalism, right? That the words can only get you so far. And then there's a whole lot of just interpretation that has to go on. You have to turn to balancing. There's, there may, you know, it's not like, you know, people have X number of words that they can say. There aren't formal, easy um, guidelines like this. They are all balancing tests. Strict scrutiny is a balancing test, and all of the the categories that the Supreme Court has come up with and tends to recite and says, well, these are clearly exceptions to the First Amendment. Those are all balancing arguments that we've meant to say child pornography may have expressive value. We don't care. And so we're going to make a decision about that. And implicitly, those decisions are made about things like perjury and about right. things like your medical information and about things like securities fraud and price fixing and any number of things. And we're back to that point we began with, which is yes. people don't want to admit that we are censoring all the time. I mean, that is part of our law, even even when we move beyond the 1800s or the 1900s. It's always been a part of our law to say right. certain things you don't get to talk about. Your doctor does not get to go on Facebook and talk about the really weird rash that you had. They're just not allowed to do it. <laughs> and no one know? thinks, oh, that's, <laughs> that's a, that, you know, you're censoring me, right? So yeah. we're, we've just be, we've convinced ourselves in America that one, we don't, that we don't restrict speech. We do all the time, just in ways that have become so natural to people, they don't see them as restrictions, which again is another way of saying there are not ways that restrict people's speech. Um, it's not the kind of speech that they're really invested in, in promoting. Most people understand that private private information is not the kind of thing you can freely distribute. But when right. it comes to, oh, you want to be able to post naked pictures of your ex, then suddenly they think, ah, oh, it's a First Amendment constitutional right. Right. Um, and the constitution of the Supremist podcast, there's a provision that requires me to mention Judge retired Judge Posner once a podcast. So I'm going to <laughs> so I'm going to so I'm going to mention him now. Um, if there's, I mean, the guy wrote you know seventy books. If there's one idea he had that I wish everybody would universally acknowledge the way you acknowledge it, not in the same terms necessarily he used, but I know you acknowledge this. Constitutional law from beginning to end in the courts is about creation. It's not about interpretation. We're not interpret. We all believe in freedom of speech. We do, in a general construct. We all believe in equality. We all believe in these things. But that doesn't tell us what to do in a case. Right. Then we have to create. And, and so even Judge Jackson three hours ago, and I, 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 I have the highest respect for Judge Jackson, and I'm not, I know she had to say this, so I'm not blaming her for it, but 
Judges interpret the law, don't make the law. That's the most pernicious idea in American politics, I think, other than racist and sexist and <laughs> homophobic ideas. Do you agree with that? Well, I think they're all connected, right? Yeah. I think that, again, that's that false pretense of neutrality is what yeah. gets us at, you know, if you keep insisting, I'm just applying the law, I'm just calling right. balls and strikes. And that law keeps, for some reason, <laughs> oppressing women and minorities, this is this is where we are, right? This is... right. The myth of neutrality and the myth of objectivity and universality, this goes all the way back to the Constitution itself. When you say we the people and you don't mean it, right? right? We would have all been better off had the Constitution actually said what it meant, which is we are white, we are wealthy, we are male, we want to make sure that we have certain privileges for ourselves and we don't care about anybody else. They're allowed to have rights to the extent that they don't conflict with ours. We're good interest convergence people. Right. But the moment right. at which those diverge, ours have to be supreme. Right. That would have made things easier had they spelled it out. But that's exactly why they wouldn't do it because at an individual and a collective level, they had to tell themselves, no, we're doing something different. We're doing law. We're doing majestic work out here. When in fact, of course, it is just what it looks like. And it makes it harder for us to criticize and to get past when we won't recognize that. It drives me nuts sometimes that um, a 1980, 1980, circa 1980 conservative, who most people respect his intellect, if nothing else, said all of this, had no agenda for saying it. I mean, it wasn't a political thing. It's just how judges think. Well, we create. It's what we do, Posner said. We have no choice. If, if, if the text answered the question, we wouldn't be in my courtroom. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I say these things today even to liberal con law professors, and they recoil, and they despise Bosner and this and that, when, when it's so obvious to me that it's all creation. It's just that's what it is. Without even saying good, bad, or indifferent, I'm just describing what it is. And what it is is not inter – we're not interpreting Dickens. We're not taking a par you know, and, and even then we're creating. But this is – Dickens used some very specific words. We don't have specific words that have precise meanings in our constitutional litigation world. We had them in the Constitution, right? 35, two senators. But not, we don't litigate those anyway. Um, you've written a lot about revenge porn. Um, I've heard the phrase. I'm familiar with it, of course. Um, but why don't you define it and then talk about it and explain how that um, you know, comes in with your free speech analysis? Yeah, and, and, and naming it and defining it is one of the most important things sure. to do at the outset because sure. the term, unfortunately, uh, and that's a term that the, the perpetrators of this abuse came up with, right? <laughs> Revenge porn. So um, really inaccurate term. The, the, the definition that I use and the phrase I use is non-consensual pornography defined as the distribution of intimate private images without consent. And this is something that has been around forever, probably as long as there have been images. Right. Um, it's certainly been around since Playboy magazine because the the first you know issue of Playboy magazine used picture new pictures of Marilyn Monroe without her consent. And right. so we have a long history in this country of of using women's bodies for entertainment and uh, without their permission. And it is it has taken a particular turn in the last few years because of the rise of social media and the internet and surreptitious photography. And it has meant that there is now kind of a, a cottage industry of websites and applications that are designed to, you know, solicit these kinds of images and to encourage people, especially men, to submit these kinds, to obtain and submit these kinds of images as a way of either providing entertainment um, and you know just sort of consumption for like-minded people, or sometimes, and this is where the revenge sometimes comes in, as a way to punish um, a partner that has decided to leave or that is threatening to leave or, um, or has done something else to displease the person who's in possession of the photographs. And I, this is not an area of the law I'm familiar with, I'm particularly familiar with, is it legal in most states to do that? Uh, in other words, if I, I have, I have a, um, let's say a, a husband gets their big fight with the wife um, and decides to get back at her by posting nude pictures on his Instagram account. He can do that? So until 2013, that would have been legal in most states. Okay. And I say that because in 2013, which is when I um, took on a position with the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, I was mm. one of the founding members um, which is an organization that was begun by a woman who had been targeted for this form of abuse and didn't and, and created the organization right. as a way to try to change the law. 
um, that was that was what she was faced with in Florida, where this happened. She was told this kind of action is it, it's it's not criminal, and if anybody's to blame here, it's you for trusting this person. Jesus. So that was pretty much the response you would get Jesus. anywhere. So 2013, when we did a survey of the laws, um, there were three states that had laws on the books that looked like they could criminalize what was happening here. And that was, New Jersey was really the best one. And it was had this very, um, I think, very future looking privacy statute that says there are such things as criminal invasions of privacy. And it's not just when you record somebody without their consent. It's when you record somebody with their consent and then distribute it without their consent, right. which is a very logical way of looking of course, at it. Yes. But only New Jersey had done. Yeah. So our work, um, what we have tried to do in, in, in the year since 2013, has been to change the law. And we've been reasonably successful so that now 48 states and the District of Columbia now have criminal statutes. Congrats. That's great. Children. That's awesome. Thank you. That's, um... And um, th there's a federal bill that we have introduced several times, was most recently reintroduced on International Women's Day that would, would criminalize us at the federal level, known as the SHIELD Act. Right. I do wonder, I'm, I, I get nervous, I'm more than nervous, about the day when someone's arrested for this makes a First Amendment argument and judges by it. So this has already happened. Yeah. Um, so our laws have been challenged in every, almost every state where they have, uh, yeah. have, you know, you can imagine that's the first thing a defendant is going to say because, yeah. well, after they say it wasn't me. So, so once we get past that, the next <laughs> thing they say is I have a first, essentially these laws violate the First Amendment. Right. And when I say the ACLU has an agenda against these laws, I mean that because in every state where we advocated to get them passed, the ACLU showed up with its tremendous resources. We are a nonprofit organization that was an all volunteer board until a couple of years ago. And now we have one paid staff member. Um, in all these contexts, it was me showing up against whoever the ACLU was going to say. I didn't that know that. The ACLU led the charge against this. Oh, led my God. the charge against this. And is continuing to do so. They have not stopped, I will say. Um, so That's in every awful. state where we were trying to pass these laws, the ACLU first tried to say, you can't have any laws against non-consensual pornography that comport with the First Amendment. That was their first stance. When it looked like the tide was turning and states were interested in passing some kind of legislation based on a model statute that I wrote in 2013, they switched their argument to saying, okay, you can have statutes against non-consensual pornography, but only, only when it was a former or current intimate partner and only if they did it with the intent to hurt the victim. And they managed to convince out of the 48 states that we have these laws in, they managed to convince the vast majority of them to add that as an element, the intent to cause distress or harm. And I, I don't even, when you think about what they're actually trying to say here, they're saying non-consensual pornography is perfectly all right, as long as you do it and perfectly, no, it's free speech. Let me, let me be clear. Yeah. Their claim is that it's free speech as long as you aren't doing it to hurt someone's feelings. If you're doing it to get money, if you're doing it to, um, you know, just get some social validation in your circles if you're doing it so that you can entertain That's people. That's insane. That, that is insane what you just said. That's insane. They have they have expended so many resources in trying to fight our laws, and then they fight them in the courts. So I have written amicus briefs <sighs> in five different Supreme Court, state Supreme Court cases to defend these laws against constitutional attack. And I will say we've won <laughs> so far. So in all five, all five states where they have risen to the highest court in that state, the courts have ultimately concluded that these laws do not violate the First Amendment, but it has been a struggle every day. And it is largely because of groups like the ACLU, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the American Booksellers Association, the Media Coalition, the, the Motion Picture Association of America got in there. Jesus. And we are faced with this huge lobby against us at every turn saying this kind of behavior is protected free speech. I'm not often left speechless. <laughs> that almost leaves me speechless. Um, I had a thought while you were talking, not about the law, um, but may explain the law. I, 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 this is, again, not – you're such a great guest because I'm, I'm usually pretty organized, and, and I'm, I'm having all these other thoughts in my head as you're talking, which is a tribute to you. Um, you know, I was thinking about what would happen if a full-blown frontal nudity picture of, let's say, um, Tom Cruise – what was was it was it somehow illegally and inappropriately gotten and 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 put in the National Enquirer or whatever, on the internet or whatever, as opposed to a fully uh, naked picture of um, uh, pick an actress I don't know um, a, a famous actress, and, um, I think there would be more outrage at the naked picture of Tom Cruise. In fact, I'm almost positive, and that's that's an insane reflection on where we are. Am I, am I, you think I'm right about that? 
Well, I think it's pretty clear that that's right. I mean, something similar has happened. Um, there was, wasn't exactly this, but okay. there was a, a male celebrity, um, and, you know, out of respect for the male celebrity, I won't repeat okay. who this is, but someone who, who clearly accidentally, I think, released a yeah. photo of himself on social yeah. media and, and pretty quickly took it down. Yeah. And the number of people who rushed in to say, you know, don't repeat, don't, if you got a screenshot of it, don't repeat, like, he didn't mean to do it, protect his privacy. And I thought, right. that's wonderful. Like, right. it's wonderful that we're protecting his privacy. But where was that attitude when Jennifer Lawrence's pictures were? That's everywhere? what I was thinking of. That, that was the actress yeah. I was trying to think of, and I couldn't think of her. Okay. Exactly yeah. this. So, so we know, like, in the great celebrity hack of a few years ago of over a hundred, nearly a hundred celebrities, right. almost every one of them was a woman. And that is, there's no coincidence here about that, about what it is that people mean when they say we should have the right to do this, or this is morally or somehow acceptable or legally acceptable. It's because we're talking about women's bodies. We really are. And it, which is not to say that this does not happen to men. It does. And there right. are an increasing number of extortion schemes that are directed primarily at men um, for catfishing purposes and what have you to get, but, but the industry that, that is capitalizing on pictures of women without their, pictures of people without their consent in sexual situations, it is it's overtly focused on women. That is the industry that we're talking about. Well, thank you for all your hard work on this. It's it's desperately needed. Um, we're running out of time. I, I could talk to you for like days. Um, I do want to know why you titled your next book, your upcoming book, Fearless. Is it Fearless Speech, right? Fearless Speech. I, I'm not. I don't. Know, I really don't know where you're going with that. So, can you give us two minutes on that? I'd be happy to. So I consider The Cult of the Constitution to be my critique book. This is to say, this is where things have gone wrong when it comes to our free speech norms and our doctrine. Fearless speech is my attempt to talk about how we can be right. That is how we can change the culture. Okay. And it's not really supposed to be so much about changing the doctrine, although I do have some doctrinal points to make. It's more for a general audience to think about how we need to have better heroes for free speech than neo-Nazis and pornographers. <laughs> that is, if we actually think of what free speech means, and I go back to this concept from the Greeks called parousia, and I talk about how Michel Foucault in the 1980s gave this series of lectures where he talked about how parousia is essential to democracy and is best translated as fearless speech as opposed to free speech. And the characteristics he talks about that I'm most interested in are that speech that should really be valorized and considered essential to democracy is speech that first and foremost is sincere, that a person takes claim and ownership over. And secondly, that it has to be speech that is um, critical. The most important speech that we have is speech that is critical of power. And the third characteristic is that it has to be speech that creates risk to the speaker. That is to say, you take some personal risk in what you were saying. Right. And my argument of this, the book is that up until this point, Americans have fetishized reckless speech. And I call that you know speech that mostly imposes risks on other people. You target other people, you're insincere, you're all of those things. It's it's about um, worshiping power and it mostly creates risks for vulnerable people. So the, the net effect of the risk is on others. And I wanna distinguish that from truly courageous speakers who have taken the risk upon themselves to say something that is genuinely um, out of step with what society considers to be acceptable. And so I wanna talk about Anita Whitney and I wanna talk about Ida Wells and I wanna talk about Christine Blasey Ford. I wanna talk right. about the, the women in particular who have truly put themselves on the line for sincere, sincere critical speech and talk about the, the idea that we should be valorizing and upholding that kind of speech over and against the kind of speech that merely makes life harder for other people. I, I can't wait to read that. That's going to be awesome. And, and uh, you probably won't make a lot of friends in America, but I'll be one of them. So um, thank you so much. On that question. Um, you know, um, reading, um, reading the Code of the Constitution and the reviews of it, um, which are all, all very favorable, most very favorable. And I want people, I want people to read this book, read the cult of the Constitution. It, it's because I do think constitutional law is a cult. You know, I, I haven't used that word, but I think I wish I, again, I'm jealous of your title. I wish that I had. But um, what I wanted to kind of ask you um, is the, the the main critique you got was you didn't, this is the last question we have time for, you didn't um, have enough solutions. Or they took you to task for pointing out the problems, but not really coming forward with alternatives. And I, and, and I, and I, and I, and I remember my, my experience writing Supreme Myths, which originally, uh, why the course not a court, which originally didn't have proposals. And everybody said, no, you have to have proposals. You have to figure out a way to solve the problem. I said, I just want to describe it first. I want to describe it. That'd be my next book. Why do I have to do it now? But they all, yes. the publisher made me do it. And they do it. Anyway, um, I think that's a really unfair critique of your book because you're <laughs> describing 
inherent problems this country has had for 200 years or more um, and, and some really big issues that people don't accept. People don't accept that free speech can be really harmful. People don't accept that we over-prioritize speech in this country. And first you have to make that case before you can make the other case. Um, I raise all of that, I guess, kind of an arrogant way to suggest, I hope you put some solutions in fearless speech just to ward off those critiques, if nothing else. Because I, I, I think just pointing out how badly we do free speech is enough. But it sounds like you're going to have some solutions too. Well, I appreciate the generous reading that you you gave of the book because you're you're right that I'm mostly focused in that book on diagnosis yeah. and because what I'm mostly concerned with is the ideological hold that the constitution has over us. That's what I'm that is my 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 work is this. It's it's to try to to right. release us from that hold, to try to alienate us from from what is become to feel like nature when it comes to the constitution. So, I consider that to be the most important contribution of the book, but but I also think that that yes, there will be space in fearless speech, and I mentioned it too in the Cult of the Constitution. But yeah. I'll I'll spend more time on it to talk about how then, if we can all agree, and I hope we can, that you know, constitutional law runs out at a certain point. Those those clear parts of it will run out at you the know, courthouse doors. Talking, at the courthouse door. <laughs> so when we're when we get there, yeah. that we should start thinking about different values. We have to populate the concept of free speech. Why not populate it in a way that actually does comport with truth or autonomy or democracy or any of the things we care we, equality we, we care too. about? And equality, right? So yeah. that is what I'm I'm gonna try to trace this out and and highlighting work like um, what we have done in the, in the space of non-consensual pornography laws to say get legislatures to pass laws that actually try to make it so that women can speak and vulnerable groups can speak because that is the work we need to do and we need to i think you know i could use a lot of help when it comes to putting more <laughs> pressure on legislators to do this yeah. and to fight the aclu when it tries to take not only sort of ideological control of this issue but actually shows up in in these legislative chambers and shows up in courts and tries to say no every Every possible way you can exploit a woman has to be protected by the First Amendment and say no to that and, and to, to reject that. I, I, I've uttered this sentence at 20 conferences in my life and been pretty much booed every time when I've said <laughs> when equality and speech fight each other or when, when, when there's a complex relationship there and we're going to not be able to get both of what we want, in this country, speech always wins. And for most of the rest of the world, free world, equality often wins. But not in America. <laughs> and, and, and I would be even maybe okay with that, maybe, if we got there through the electoral process. But we don't. Right. We get there for because five or more unelected lawyers in Washington decided that's how it has to be. And it's very frustrating. And you are such a refreshing light on this issue. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. I, I really enjoy talking to you. I think we are kindred spirits in a lot of ways. Um, and that makes me happy. So <laughs> thank you so much. for It makes me here. happy too. And thank you so much for this opportunity to have a conversation about these ideas. This uh, was, this is really, really important and clarifying for me as well. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Bye thank bye. you.